The Bengals added 10 players in the 2021 NFL Draft last weekend, but how much better did they get? We've heard from Paul Alexander on this channel about Jackson Carmen, the second round pick, and we're going to dive into him along with the rest of the Bengals draft selections over the next few minutes. Hi again, everyone. I'm James Rapine, publisher here at Cincinnati Bengals Talk, and we tried to let it bake a little bit. There were a lot of draft grades out there, and we know how it is draft seasons. You know what I, I figured in, in my uh, co-worker, Andrew Miller, and I, we said, let's wait a couple days before we break down the Bengals draft pick by pick. So let's dive into it. One, if you're familiar with my work here at Cincinnati Bengals talk, Jamar Chase, fifth overall. I think it was the right decision. Playmakers win games. There's a reason why Tom Brady was the one that went to Tampa Bay, and it wasn't because they were taking an offensive lineman in round one last year. It was because of Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, their willingness to go get a Rob Gronkowski, their willingness to go get Leonard Fournette. By the way, guess what? The Bucks went and got Geo. You can't have enough weapons in today's NFL. And I think the Bengals realized that. They look at this draft and said, there's only one Jamar Chase in this draft. We're not going to be able to find Jamar Chase in round two, three, or four. You know what we can do? We can get a starting guard, uh, even a starting tackle, address those positions later in the draft. And like I said, we're going to get to all 10 picks here. But as far as Chase, strong hands, downfield ability, and I think that's going to be the biggest difference from what they had last year with A.J. Green and the rest of the Bengals receivers to what they're going to get with Jamar Chase. Joe Burrow's going to push the ball down the field. This is a guy in Chase that averaged over 21 yards per catch, had 1,780 yards with Joe Burrow in 2019, 20 touchdowns, 84 receptions, and heck, he set his goal, rookie of the year. Well, if he's going to accomplish that goal, guess what? He's going to have to put up big numbers, and the Bengals are expecting him to right away. So we'll see if he can accomplish that goal. He was throwing out 10 touchdowns, 50-plus receptions, and 1,500 yards. That would be a rookie record, by the way, if he hits that yardage total. I'm sure the Bengals will take 1,000 yards, 10 touchdowns, and 50 receptions all day long from Jamar Chase in his rookie season. But he should have an instant impact on the Bengals' offense in 2021. And I know Joe Burrow was happy that they picked number one with number five. Let's jump to the second round where it's really a three-parter. But let's just start with Jackson Carmen. The Bengals were going to take Jackson Carmen with the 38th pick. I have it on good authority that they were comfortable there, and I had that before the draft that they were targeting him or before the second round of the draft on that Friday. And since then, Zach Taylor said, yeah, we were willing and comfortable taking the Clemson offensive lineman there. I like Carmen, but I understand why people were underwhelmed by the pick. He was not getting the hype that some of these other guys were getting. But what do I see when I look at Jackson Carmen? Guy's 330 pounds. He's 6'4", good athleticism, ability to move, checked out medically, even though he did have that back issue that he played through at Clemson this past season. And I look at it, and again, they were looking for a plug-and-play right guard. That's what they were looking for. Well, I think that's what they got in Jackson Carmen. So is it the name you wanted? Not necessarily. And I totally get it. I had written Jackson Carmen as a third round type of guy. But again, there was no draft gospel this year. And that's something worth noting. I think draft boards were all over when it comes to these 32 NFL teams. Wyatt Hubert, who I'm going to get to in a bit, the Bengals had a much higher draft grade on him than a seventh rounder, which is where they ended up getting him. So Jackson Carmen, the fact that they get him in round two might have felt like a reach publicly, but overall, you look at his traits, you look at his skill set, I can certainly see why they like him, why they think he can be a plug-and-play guard and eventually transition with some refinement, with some technique, um, re refining that, that technique and upgrading that technique and improving the technique. He can end up becoming a starting tackle in the NFL, and we'll see about that. Worst case, though, he's a guard and probably a pretty damn good guard when you look at his athleticism and his power and his ability to move. So I like Jackson Carmen overall. I get the concerns. I get why it was underwhelming. And the best part about this, they got two extra picks. So they got their guy at 38, but they moved down eight spots, still get him, uh, the, the guy they were going to take at 38, at 46. And guess what? Two fourth rounders that 
I think they absolutely won the trade, by the way, with the Patriots. I know there was a lot of interest in the 38th pick, and we'll get to the guys that they got with those two fourth rounders in a bit. But here's the best value of the draft. The best guy, the the biggest faller, the, the guy I think can make an instant impact on the Bengals' defensive line. Joseph Osai, how do you not like this kid out of Texas? He is... Man, he's fun. He's got a a fun personality. You could see how excited and happy he was to be drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals. He's going to wear that number 58 and uh, replace Carl Lawson in not just number. I think he's literally going to replace Carl Lawson because they're they're similar. Osai doesn't have the injury issues that Carl Lawson had coming out of Auburn, but He's got the twitch. He's got the athleticism. He's got that ability uh, to win on the edge. And while I think Lawson might have been been a little bit more refined and technique-wise, knew where he was as a player, I think Osai has this untapped potential that you can get to. He's got a high motor, as people say, which to me just means he works his ass off. And there's a lot to like about him. So I think he was an absolute steal at 69. And I, I was told that he was at least being considered at 38. So certainly in the, the range there where the fact that he fell to round three was a pretty easy decision for the Cincinnati Bengals. Next pick is another defensive end. They went with three, three straight defensive linemen, Cam Sample out of Tulane. I like him as well. He's a guy that they looked at at the Senior Bowl. And the thing that you like about Cam is the fact that he's versatile. He can play all across the defensive line. If you need to line him up at three tech at times, he's certainly going to be capable of doing that. They're anticipating him putting on maybe 10 pounds or so, has the frame for it, but his versatility is key. And the Bengals needed to boost their pass rush. As much as we talk about offense, and I was all about only offensive line and wide receiver and just give Joe Burrow everything he wants. And I still like that strategy. At the same time, if they're truly going to win, they need to be able to get after opposing quarterbacks. Cam Sample certainly helps them do that. The other thing that they struggled with last year uh, during long stretches, I think back to week two against the Cleveland Browns when they could not get off the field and the Browns, when Joe Burrow's just balling out on national TV, his second game four days after his NFL debut, throws for 300 plus yards. And guess what? The Browns end the game. Eight straight runs, I believe it was, to Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb. Just run it right down the Bengals' throats and clinch the game and win in prime time. Well, guess what? That's why you go get a Tyler Shelvin. That's why you get this 350, 360-pound beast from LSU that was getting day two consideration. It was talked about as a day two prospect before he opted out of the 2020 season. Has a quick first step. Certainly has the traits you look for in a two-down nose tackle. And to me, in the AFC North, when you have the Baltimore Ravens who run the ball like crazy with Lamar Jackson and that, you know, J.K. Dobbins and that running crew, you got the two best running back tandem, or the best running back tandem, the two best one-two punch at running back in the Browns with Kareem Hunt and Nick Chubb. And then Najee Harris, the Steelers, certainly trying to get back to their roots and run the ball more this coming year when they took Najee Harris, 24th overall. You need a guy like Shelvin, and you put Shelvin next to Reader. I like it. It makes sense. I can certainly see the vision there. But again, I was, like, at this point, three straight defensive linemen. All right, Lou, can you sit down, Lou Anarumo? And hey, hey, Brian Callahan, go tell them you need some more offensive line help. And that's exactly what they got with their very next pick. And that's the thing here, is you get Shelvin, in the trade, essentially, to move down from 38 to 46. That was the first pick that you got. And then the second one, you get Deontay Smith. And I love Deontay Smith because of the potential, because of the upside. For all of the talk about offensive linemen in this draft, even the top guys, Penny Sewell, Rashawn Slater, there were measurables that were at least a little concerning. Arm length with both both of those guys, 33-inch arms, that's concerning when you're talking about an NFL tackle. Jackson Carmen in that same boat. Deontay Smith, Not so much. He's coming out of ECU, so he's going to need to gain some weight, gain some strength, get used to life in the NFL. But it would not shock me at all if Deontay Smith is your starting right tackle as soon as 2022, maybe 2023, with the refinement, with the work that Frank Pollock is going to put in with this kid. 35 and a half inch arms, 85 inch wingspan. Deontay Smith, I, I, I love it. I love the measurables here. And I was talking to uh, a scout earlier this week. He thinks Smith can easily put on the weight necessary to play tackle in the NFL. And that the, the, the COVID, he got COVID at some point. And there was just 
things that last season, by the way, and it was just things that caused his weight to drop a bit. So yeah, he's hovering just over 300 pounds, but they think he can get to, you know, 315, 320, still move well, uh, gain the strength. And he certainly has the length to at worst be a quality NFL guard. So I love the Smith pick at that point. And let's get to the controversial pick, I guess. And I guess it was a bit controversial. Evan McPherson, 149th overall, the kicker out of Florida. Am I crazy for liking this pick? I get it. It's the fifth round. But if the Bengals got it right with this kid, then it's a steal. Because if you can get a weapon that routinely kicks 50-plus yard field goals, we've seen it with Justin Tucker and the Ravens for years and years and years. I'll go back to uh, last year's Super Bowl champs and the the runner-up, back-to-back AFC champion Kansas City Chiefs. Harrison Butker is a weapon for them. Even Patrick Mahomes has to settle for field goals sometimes. Even Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, and T. Higgins, they're going to have to settle for field goals, especially in the AFC North. So if Evan McPherson could come in and regularly hit 50-plus yard field goals, and by the look of it, this trick shot right here, look at this thing. If he can do that regularly, then it's a great pick. Now, there is risk in it because if he's just an average NFL kicker, well, then you reached and you got it wrong. But if he reaches his full potential and by all accounts, he's one of those guys, one of those elite talents, more talented, by the way, from people that I talk to and not people within the Bengals organization, outsiders that have no vested interest in Evan McPherson or Jake Elliott. He's more talented than Jake Elliott was from a few years ago, the Bengals fifth round pick that they ultimately cut in favor of Randy Bullock, which was a mistake. I think we all admit it. It was a mistake despite Bullock having a better training camp. I don't think that's going to be the case here with McPherson. I think he outperforms um, Austin Seibert anyways, because he's more talented. He just is. But even if he doesn't, I think McPherson's going to be the guy regardless of how training camp goes because he is so talented and because there is so much upside with him. Let's go to the sixth round where the Bengals address offensive line again. I like Trey Hill. I do. And part of the reason why I think he tested poorly out of Georgia, he was dealing uh, with some leg issues. But in the sixth round, SEC pedigree, a guy that's you know really tough to move, thick lower body, Someone that I think could develop into something. And, and that is the, the thing here. As bad as the Bengals' offensive line was last year, a lot of that had to do with their depth. They didn't have any. They didn't have any depth. In the moment that one guy went down, you suddenly had to play Fred Johnson at tackle. Or you had to keep Michael Jordan in there. You had no one else to replace him even though he was struggling. That's not going to be the case this year. And you get a guy like Trey Hill, certainly a good prospect that you can develop. And again, throw to Frank Pollock and say, mold Deontay Smith, whose former head coach at ECU said he's a, a clay. He's, he's just a ball of clay. You can mold him into a starting tackle. I, I think the same thing here, certainly more refined in a, a guy in Trey Hill because he went to Georgia. He had the quality coaching for four years, which is something that Smith didn't have. But two guys that Frank Pollock can really mold and get something out of long term. Let's stay in the sixth round. Chris Evans, Captain America himself out of Michigan. This might be one of my favorite picks, maybe my favorite pick on day three because of his upside. He's got plenty of tread left on the tires, only had 16 carries last year for Michigan. And the red flag is apparently he plagiarized something. And I'm not going to downplay this, but I think that there are a lot of people watching this that plagiarized something, maybe not in college, but in high school, because you want to get it done. Certainly there are a lot of athletes out there that did that. And I'm not knocking them because you're busy, right? And he got caught. And so he wasn't able to play for an entire year and then really was out of the rotation last year. But man, is this kid talented and he's not going to have to go into the classroom. You know who else didn't like school? Chad Johnson. Chad Johnson really struggled at school, hated it. A lot of athletes do. Well, guess what? Chris Evans, as long as he knows the playbook and the Bengals love his intelligence, love his potential as a pass blocker. Giovanni Bernard, like I mentioned, in Tampa Bay now, I love Evans. He tested extremely well. One of the the most athletic running backs, not only in this class, but running backs over the past 20 years, the way he tested. I think he got a a 9.75 from relativeathleticscores.com, which basically compiles all of his testing from Michigan's Pro Day. And Brian Callahan, and we posted this right here on Cincinnati Bengals Talk, Brian Callahan just went on and on and on about Chris Evans and what he did at the Senior Bowl. His ability to get open in one-on-one situations, I love it because he's going to fry opposing linebackers if he can 
prove himself as a pass blocker. If he does that and he, he shows any kind of special teams value, I certainly think he makes the team because he's, again, a high-end talent, wasn't used a lot. That's good in a way because that means that he wasn't taking the hits and he's not beat up like some of these running backs are coming out of school. And last but certainly not least, the guy that the Bengals had in the fifth round. Fifth round grade on Wyatt Hubert out of Kansas State. Not an elite athlete by any stretch. His testing numbers won't wow you. But what will is his production. He's a sack maker. He's a football junkie, as they say. And I know that's cliche, but we were talking to Wyatt Hubert after he was drafted. And one thing he said was, yeah, I went to the special teams meetings as a senior, and I knew I wasn't going to play on special teams. I mean, he's one of the best players on the Wildcats defense at Kansas State. But he went because he knew at the next level, he was going to have to cut his teeth on special teams and he wanted to be ready for it. And I absolutely love that attitude. Do not be shocked if Wyatt Hubert is a 53-man roster, if he makes this team, makes that 53-man roster because of his special teams ability and his versatility. He can play inside, can play outside, and the Bengals certainly thought highly of him. Uh, I was talking to Mike Potts on the Locked on Bengals podcast, and he's uh, the Bengals director uh, of college scouting. And he said that they they loved Hubert, and he was clearly the best player on their board when they took him with their final draft selection at 235th overall. So overall, I see the vision. Love the chase pick. What's not to like? Jackson, Carmen, it's questionable, no doubt about it, because there are other guys that at least the consensus had higher But I see the vision and I see the traits that the the Bengals saw, and that's why they made the pick. As far as Osai, Sample, Shelvin, you got to bolster the pass rush. Love Osai the most, but I think Shelvin might be a a game changer, honestly, in the AFC North, as long as he can keep his weight under control. That was a concern at LSU. McPherson, you make 50-plus yarders, you're certainly worth it. And you just go down the line. I've been raving about Deontay Smith, been raving uh, about Trey Hill at that stage of the draft. I think both are good long-term upside picks. And not all of these guys are going to work out. There's no doubt about it. You saw my face light up when I talked about Chris Evans. The Bengals certainly thought highly of Wyatt Hubert. But overall, I think it was a very successful draft. And if you hit on three of these guys, one becomes an all-pro. Let's say Jamar Chase becomes an all-pro. Jackson Carmen becomes a solid starting guard. And Deontay Smith ends up starting at right tackle. That alone, that alone makes it a successful draft. All right? And I think they hit on more than just three of these guys. So we'll see what happens. Here's what I do know is we got you covered all off-season long here on Cincinnati Bengals Talk. So if you're new to the channel... We're just getting started here, baby. Plenty, plenty coming your way. And by the way, we posted a poll question. How about you chime in right here on Cincinnati Bengals Talk? Give us your draft grade. I'm going to give them a solid B with potential upside because I see the potential for an A. I do. At the same time, if Jackson Carmen doesn't work out, this could be a C draft. This could be a C minus draft. So there is some risk there, and it's going to be on the shoulders of Jackson, Carmen, and these other offensive linemen to develop and keep Joe Burrow upright. And guess what? That's Frank Pollock's turn. It's Frank Frank Pollock's job to do it. I think he's certainly an upgrade from Jim Turner. We'll see if he can get it done. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for subscribing. Make sure you vote in the poll, and I will talk to you soon.